lives inside of each and every one of us that's believers. He's inside of us. As the song says, I want nothing else. I want nothing else but Jesus. There isn't anything that I would want but him. I'm so thankful to God that we get to come to a place to praise and worship and hear the word of God. The truth. What's the truth? The truth is this. This is what we stand on. This is what we believe in. I just thank you. Father God, if you would, please bow your heads. I know before Pastor Ben gets up here, let me just pray. Father God, Lord, we just thank you, Father God, Lord, that you are here with us, Lord. I ask, Lord, right now, Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, Lord, let the words, Lord, that you have given Ben, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, let it come into us and remain with us, Father God. Lord, let us just get into your word and grow with you and go deeper in your word, Jesus. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, God, Lord, for who you are. Like the, the previous song says, Abba, Father, you define who we are. Your words, your word of God defines who we are, God. And Lord, that's what we stand on. And we thank you, Jesus, Lord, that we are here today and that this message is going to touch us and go into our spirit. Lord, we were going to carry it forth and we're going to go out and evangelize. We're going to go out and be witnesses for you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. So today, we are in part three, part three in the letters, the seven letters, pretty, pretty simple, if there's seven letters, it's part three, we got four more after this one, right? <laughs> today is le it's letter number three to the Church of Pergamum, and it is about living an uncompromising life, an uncompromising life. Uh, we see that Pergamum as a letter we'll read the scriptures here in just a moment that the, the 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 city itself as john calls it jesus says this in red letters that it is satan's throne satan's throne is there we have to understand why this was this is going on we have this emperor emperor uh domitian domitian he is brother who was emperor and his dad who's emperor before they have died now and he has reinstituted the imperial worship of the Roman emperor anybody that's the Roman emperor in the family is to be worshipped and Pergamum is the city the first city in Rome that was designated as a place of worship for this Roman emperor they put this out there that this is where the worship of him and his family was to occur. So we see that this deity of what he says was he felt like he was a, a god, that they were going to worship him in this place. Now we also have many other temples in this town. We even have a, a, a altar to Zeus in this town where they sacrifice to Zeus. So there's a lot of things going on here, and that's why we start with that, because they are a compromised church, even though it says they've stood up to so many things, and we're going to cover this in the scriptures today, that they cut, that they stood up to Roman rule. And we see here that uh, the, the gentleman that was over Antipas, who was over the church, he was actually martyred in public. And they were still standing in faith with God. Let me let you understand what happened here. Okay, in a public square, they have this bronze pot in the shape of a bull, right? It's in the shape of a bull. It has a head. It's got an opening at the top. They lit a fire up and they put Antipas inside of it and slow roasted him in public because he would not bow to the emperor. Mm. Okay? And they were still dedicated to Jesus. They saw this in the open square. They saw this. I mean, we, we think about it today, man. If somebody walks in here and says with a gun to our head, will we denounce Jesus or will we stand there? 
gun to my head right now, Ben. No, these people, they were right there. They, that Death could come to them at any time, and they were still worshiping Jesus. However, he has an issue with some things that they're doing. That there's a point to this. Even though you can worship and love Jesus Christ, if you put things in your life as they did, Jesus has an issue with that. The things of this world, the things that were going on around us today, they're so easily infiltrated into our lives, isn't it? aren't they? Yes, they are. Man, it's so easy. We have to make sure that we stand at all times armored up from head to toe. We've got our, our helmet of salvation, and all of us wear a helmet of salvation, right? But we got to put on the other stuff, too. Come on. We've got to have the armor, the, the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Where does that come from? Mm. Righteousness. Are we living righteous? If we're not, we don't have that breastplate on. If we don't, how are we carrying the faith, the shield of faith? And even that, we have the belt of truth. Praise God, I got a belt on right now and my pants would fall off. Come on. Come on. That's where the truth does. It keeps you prepared in the truth. Then our shoes, that shoes, the peace of the gospel, it prepares us to go out and evangelize. Amen. My job here and my calling is a pastor right but we're all called to be ministers yes. we are all every single one of us are called to go into the street and preach the word of God and we do that what with the sword the sword of the spirit so we need to be armored up every single day because what happened is their armor was down and they were letting things into their cells and into their church that Jesus had an issue with it's essential that even when changes happen in the world, that we realize our God is not changing. Come on. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same tomorrow. We hear this all the time. It's a new age. Everything that we're going through today, and I know they didn't have cell phones back then. I know they didn't have internet back then. They didn't have news that was going around the world. But the things, the sins of this world, the devil doesn't have a new bag of tricks, folks. Mm -hmm. He's just using other things to do the same things that he's always done. He's always had cheating on your spouse. He's always had drunkenness. He's always had lasciviousness. He's always had lewdness. He's always had all those things that we see, the works of the flesh that are in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. He's always had those things. They're active today. There's nothing new in this world. Well, it's changed. Times are changing. They had homosexuals back then, guys. They had men that dressed up as women, and they went in as prostitutes into the temples of these idols. They had that then. That's nothing new today. It's not, not new today. Okay? They were sacrificing their babies even then to God's Moloch. They would actually sacrifice, have their baby, and it would drop into the God, the bronze God. We talked about this last week. The same things that are going on today were going on then. So don't think it's a new age so we can have a progressive Christian attitude. There is no progressive Christian attitude. It is the same yesterday, it's the same today, and it's the same tomorrow. Yes. So if you would, please, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 12. I'm going to read 12 through 17, and then we're going to look at each scripture so we understand what's going on here. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic, which breaks it down a little bit more, and then we're going to break down every particular scripture uh, as well. Then to the angel is the messenger of the assembly, which is the church. The assembly, the church. We know that Jesus, the church of Jesus, right? That's his body. That's the ecclesia. But it also means the assembly, a group of people gathering together in an area. In Pergamum, right. These are the words of him who has and wields the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you live, a place where Satan sits enthroned. Yet, you are clinging to and holding fast my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed, martyred in your midst where Satan dwells. Nevertheless, 
I have a few things against you. You have some people there who are clinging to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to set a trap and a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to entice them to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and to practice lewdness, giving themselves up to sexual vice. You also have some who, in a similar way, are clinging to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, those corruptors of the people, which thing I hate. Verse 16, repent then, or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, he who is able to hear, let him listen to and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies, the churches. To him who overcomes, who conquers, I will give to eat of the manna that is hidden, and I will give him a white stone with a new name engraved on the stone, which no one knows or understands except him who receives it. So we look here first. And I'm going to break these scriptures down using the NLT and the Passion Translation. So I'm going to go get to real quick. Real quick. Chapter 2. Okay. We're going to start at Revelation 2, verse 12. Okay, we're going to break these things down so we understand what Jesus is saying to the church of today. Because we have to understand everything in the Bible. What is the purpose of the Bible if it is not applicable today? That's right. Why would it be there? Why would he spend the time having his spirit speak through a man to write it down if it's not something, well, that's the Old Testament, that's yesterday. No, the Testament, Old Testament is where the law starts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, from the beginning to the end. His book from the beginning to the end was given in love. Every single word, every single period, every single comment, every cross T is important in the word of God. Amen. Every bit of it. Amen. So we see in Revelation 2, verse 12, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the two-edged sword. Now I want to read uh, read rather quickly instead of saying real quick. Hebrews 4, 12. <laughs> For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing and effective. That means that word of God is always flowing. It is never ending. It is energizing. It gives you energy. It is operative. It can be operative in your life. How is the word of God operative in your life if it's not in your heart though, right? Mm. We've got to put it in our heart. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, which is the soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints and marrow of the deepest part of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing. Come on, everybody needs to hear this. The Word of God exposes, it sifts, and analyzes, and judges the very thoughts and processes of our heart. Mm. We have to understand what this two-edged sword was. Why is Jesus talking about the two-edged sword here? You know the symbol of power for the Roman Empire was the two-edged sword. They'd have it <laughs> pasted, pasted up, their power. They were omnipotent in their mind. They were all, all over the world. They would display the two-edged sword for their power. Jesus is saying, I've got a sharper sword. Come on. I've got a sharper sword, and I'm telling you right now, I hold it. I am the capital W of the Word of God, as we see in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, that's Jesus, and the Word was God, that's Jesus. He is a sharp, sharp sword, double-edged. It can go both ways, right? And it comes out of his mouth. Why is that? Because that's the Word of God. That's it. That's the Word of God. We have to understand there's a difference between what the Romans were putting on display. That was fear. That was fear. And the, with the, the, the sword of Jesus, that is the awe. There's a difference between that 
kind of fear and the fear that we need to have with God. Yes. That awe of who he is, right? Yes. Yes. So we see in Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, we see why it's important to have the correct thought process when we look at things, okay? Matt, I'm going to read from the message translation. I don't have an actual Bible with a message translation. I'm going to have to read it from my screen here because I gave the, my message translation actually to someone as a gift. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threat of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God, who holds your entire life, body, and soul in his hand. Nobody out there, no matter what they say to you, no matter what they do to you, even if someone walks up to me and pops me in the head, right? Right? And I, where am I going to be the next second? Right at his throne. I don't have to worry about any of that. I don't want to live in fear over what the world can do to me. Now, I'm not going to be foolish, okay? I'm not going to go down to Fifth Ward in the middle of the night and walk around. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, that would, be, that would be dumb, right? That would not be wisdom. That would not be heavenly wisdom for me to do these things. But I'm not afraid if someone walks in my door and comes at me. Why? Because I know where I'm going to be. I know who I serve. Come on. That's who I care about. Do I care about what people say about me? No. No. I'm going to live in this word. Now, if they re read this word differently... They need to let me know. Tell me what scriptures in here that are backing up your earthly opinions. Come on. And I'm talking about not just the scripture. I'm talking about the, in context of the entire chapter. We have to be careful of these things, right? Why? Because we want to save our fear, our awe of him. Our awe of him. And the, the Roman words, I mean, the Greek words are different. Fear, phobos, and I think it's Dahlia, I'm not 100%, is the awe of God. There's two different words that are being used here in the Greek. We have to understand both of them. That's why it's important that we get into the word and study the word. Amen. Because the way it's translated into English can be confusing. We have to know what God said in the very beginning, right? Amen. So we go on to verse 13. Verse 13. I know. You live in the city where Satan has his throne. Yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. So even with the death of this church leader, this person, they were still in close contact and still had a close relationship, still proclaiming their faith. I look around the world today and I wonder if that still happens. Here in America, you don't see that. In other countries, you do. In China, if they catch you worshiping God, they will throw you in jail, right? They will come to your home. They will make sure, I don't know if they even put cameras in there. They, they put up, they take up in, down anything that they had up and they put pe uh, uh, pictures of leaders of the state in their home. That's right. And they check on them all the time. And if they don't like it, they send them in jail. They just disappear. Mm -hmm. They actually, and I've read this article, they actually have a, uh, a I don't know, it's an 18-wheeler that drives around. It's a mobile brainwashing center. They will take these Christians and they will put them in this mobile 18-wheeler to make sure that they are worshiping the Chinese government and not Jesus. It what sounds, if that, sounds crazy, but it's it true. It sounds crazy, but it's true. <laughs> Now, we live such a sheltered life here. Eh, it's kind of nice today. I'm not going to even go to church. It's raining. I'm not going to go to church. I mean, those guys are dying to go to church, man. They will get a, they'll get a chapter of the Bible, and they will memorize it from beginning to end. Why? So when they get together, they got the whole Bible. You, you memorize this scripture. You memorize this chapter. You do that. So when they come together, they have it in their hearts, and they can proclaim the entire word of God. What would happen if the government here in the United States took our Bibles away? Most of us would like, I should have read it. Mm. Come on. How many people have opened their Bibles this week? 
every single day open their Bibles. Mm. And I'm not talking about just the Word. I'm talking about maybe your phone app, your version Bible app, or anything like that. Have we got in our Word every single day? Have we? Abba Father, I am who you say I am. How do you know what he says about you if you haven't even opened your Bible? Come on now. Because the news will tell you who you are, right? You can turn that on and it'll tell you how horrible the world is. Look what's happening. This is who you are. If you are a Republican, you're horrible. If you're a Democrat, you're horrible. Jesus says in Luke, join my party. Whose party are we in today? Are we in the world's party? Because the world's not going to save us, right? We know the world's going to end. You read to the read to the end of the book. Read to the end of the book. You're going to find out what happens to this world. We're so concerned about what other people think and what other people are doing in this world that we forget it is not important. Our battle is a spiritual battle. Come on. It says that. Our battle is with the dark principalities and the evil forces of this world. It is not a hand-to-hand -hand combat. How do I handle when she comes at me? How do I handle it? All right, I got to interrupt you. I'm going to pray for you. Click. That's it. You don't need to sit there and argue. You don't need to sit there and go over things. I'm going to pray for you. Click. I had this guy, this, this pastor. I don't know why I commented. This is like eight months ago. He was, he was putting something out there. He was using scriptures for a political viewpoint. And I said, and I was very distraught with what he was saying. I'm like, man, you can't use scripture for your political viewpoint. Man, I got pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of just trashing me. And I said, well, brother, if I'm wrong, I'll pray for me. And if you're wrong, I'll pray for you. He's like, don't pray for me. I said, now I know you're not a man of God. And I just got rid of that altogether. Because if somebody doesn't want you to pray for them, that's an issue, right? Yeah. That's a problem. That, I mean, that's a telltale sign whose side they are on. Mm -hmm. So now we go on to verse 14. Verse 14. But, now these guys, man, Antipas got killed in their midst. They're still proclaiming Jesus, and they still have something wrong going on in their church. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. All right, now what does Balaam, this prophet in the Old Testament, this is back in Numbers, okay? Numbers, this is the beginning of the Bible. Back in chapter 22, 23, Balak was uh, it's like, sees these Israelites coming, man, these people are going to take over us. I need somebody that can curse them. Hey, there's this guy, Balaam. This is this witch, this warlock. Let's get him. Mm. This is who Balaam is, okay? Now, Balaam, they go to him with all these, Balak sends all these princes, all this money, all of this stuff to pay for divination. That's what the word of God says. To pay for his witchcraft. Okay? He goes to them and he goes, well, I got to pray to my Lord. Why does he say that? Because he was praying to anybody and everybody. Any spirit out there, he was worshiping God and he was worshiping other idols at the same time. Because anybody that would get him to where he needed to be to cause these spells and these actions to happen, he was all for it. Right? Mm -hmm. So he, they come to him and, and God tells him, no. Do not go with these people. Do not go with these people. Okay, so that's a lot of money, God. Do not go with these people. And they got sacks of cash. Do not go with these people. So they take off. They go back to Balak. They say, hey, he won't come with us. Well, send him more riches. Send him more riches. Balaam's there. It's a lot more money. God, can I go with them now? God says you can go with them. But when he woke up, wakes up in the morning, God is very angry with Balaam. Let me, let me make a point here. God will allow us sometimes to do things that we won't. Okay? We've already talked about this. You've got to go back and watch this message on permissive will versus perfect will. Because sometimes we will want something so much. We'll knock on that door. We'll knock on that door. We'll knock on that door. 
fine. If you've got to have it, that door's open. And that's the worst mistake we make, right? Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. God allows things. You want, why does he allow those things? To teach us something, to grow us where we need to be. What happens? Balaam gets on his donkey, and God puts one of his angels out there, and the angel's going to kill Balaam, okay? The donkey stops. Balaam gets off his donkey and beats his donkey three times. And this is the, this is the story we all know. This is where the, the donkey spoke to him. Why are you beating me, Balaam? God opens his eyes and he sees this. He understands this at this point. So he goes and he makes four prophecies over the, the, the people of Israel to Balak. Infuriates Balak. Why? Because he blesses Israel and not Balak. He was paying him the whole time to do that. So he says, just get away from me. But Balak, Balak, or Balaam rather, Balaam at that particular point was like, I got to make some of that money. God told me not to do any witchcraft. But what can I do? So he instructed Balak, let the Moabite women go in there and seduce the Israelite men. If they do that, these men will start sleeping with these women and they'll start worshiping their gods. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to understand here? What does that have to do with the church today? Man, I'm, I'm not sleeping with any idolatrous women and I'm not consuming these foods that are sacrificed. I'm not doing these things. We have to understand the word here is fago, eat, okay? Eat. Now let me read this scripture first and then we're going to understand something here in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 21. So think about food that people offer to idols as sacrifice. I'm not saying that the idols are gods. And this is small g. The food that people offer to them is not special food. But the people who offer foods to idols are worshiping demons. Mm. Okay? Any kind of idol out there, anything that we put before God is a demonic worship. That's what he's saying here. It's not my words. You can read it yourself. Hmm. They are not worshiping God when they do that. I do not want you to share in what they do to worship demons. If you drink anything from a cup of demons, you cannot then drink wine from the Lord's cup. If you share a meal with demons, you cannot also share in the Lord's meal. The caution here today for the church of today is not to let the world infiltrate itself into here. Okay? And that is as far as the ecclesia, the assembly, but also the church that is here. Not letting the world come in and tell you, well, that's okay to do. Now, my friend will call me up and say, let's go to the bar. No. Man, you, you, you used to be cool. Well, I'm cool for Jesus now, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Why? Because when I sit down and I start drinking, I start changing. Mm -hmm. I know. I open myself up to something that is not godly at That's all. That's right. So I don't just, I don't even, well, I don't, you can limit it to one beer. No, I know myself. And so do the demons that have watched me my whole life. If they can get one beer in me, there's going to be two. And if they can get two, I'm going to stop at 12, right? Mm. So I don't want to do that. If I'm driving down the road and I see a restaurant, you might think this is crazy. God, is it okay to eat here? Mm -hmm. No, keep on driving. That's right. Why? I don't know what's in there, but he does. That's right. That's right. I don't know what's going on inside of there. I don't know what those people are doing inside of there. I don't know what demonic forces may be operating inside of that place. I want to know which direction he wants me to go. Amen. In. That's the problem with this people that were had Balaam in here. What they were doing was they were combining spiritualism, paganism with Christianity. They were bringing the two together, saying it's okay to do these things. We see in the church of Corinth that Paul speaks about this as we just read. Why is he speaking about this? Because before they got saved, they'd go eat with their buddies. Let's go have lunch at the temple. Let's go, man. Let's go. What do they have? Blue Play Special, man. Chicken fried steak. Awesome. Right? 
Oh, you're supposed to laugh at that. That was funny. <laughs> they didn't have chicken fried steak. <laughs> That's just what I like to eat. Come on. Come on. There you go. Everybody's like, oh, what time, what time is it? Come on, man. That was, that was fun. Let's go, down, let's go down to the temple and eat the chicken fried steak today. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. My wife knows how to make me feel good about myself. And she always tells me, my daughter and her are like, oh, you're, you're not really that funny. So everybody laughs at me. Who? <laughs> Never mind. I laugh at myself. That's the most important thing, right? That's it. So what was happening at this church of Corinth is they were going out with eating at their buddies and it was okay. So when they got saved, they thought it was still okay to do that. Why? It wasn't the food. It didn't have anything to do with the food. It had to do with its activity with the demonic. Okay? That's it. That's it. The demonic. Yeah. That's why we want to be cautious with what we put in our bodies. This, let's go back to the word fago. Fago means to eat. Well, we all understand that, right? You can see that I understand that, right? To eat. But it means so much more than that. It means to consume everything that we put in our eyes, everything that we put in our ears, anything that we put into our body, we watch, we participate in, we consume, right? Yes. And it also means that it consumes us. Mm. The things that we consume, we have to be cautious of. There's things that are like, well, that's not too bad. I don't participate in that because that might not become a problem right here, but it may open the door for something over here that may be a problem. Does everybody understand this, what I'm saying? Yes. The reason that I don't do this thing, these things, well, there's not a whole lot in the Bible about that. My spirit tells me don't participate in that. Why? It may not become a problem, but over here, it may let something in. Mm. So I want to pay attention to my spirit man. Where's my spirit man? Spirit man was made, was made perfectly, made ready for heaven, right? Yes. Everybody understand this? The flesh is dying. It's going to pass. It's, it's, it's not forever, okay? We are going to be given a new body according to the word of God. Our soul, that is where we get the word, I don't know how to say it in the Greek, where we get the word psyche comes from the word soul. These two things are immortal. Our soul and our spirit are immortal, okay? Our flesh is not. So what we put inside of that, that's where our spirit goes towards, and our soul, that definitely, I have to control my soul all the time. I have to control my thoughts. I have to control my emotions. I have to give them to God. How do I do that? I get in my secret place every single day with Him. God, show me what I need to do today. You need to stop doing that. Well, that's not too bad. I'm, you know, I'm starting to start getting a little bailing in me. You follow me? That's not too bad. No, there's a purpose behind that. I don't want you to participate in that. So we have to be cautious. And here's one thing that this morning, as I was reading, I want to go to Isaiah. Somebody turn to Isaiah 58.1, please. Isaiah 58.1. No hurry. Not at all. Isaiah 58 1. God was, God was speaking to me as I was in studying in prayer this morning. Isaiah 58 1. Just the first sentence, not the whole verse, just the first sentence. Are you ready? If you would, please read it loud. Shout the voice of the trumpet. I'm, oh, God. Y'all can do it in unison. That's a stereo. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Shift. I want you to look up Luke 9. Luke 9, please, ma'am. Luke 9, 59. Luke 9, 59. Start there. But so I want you to read Isaiah 58, 1 loudly, please, ma'am. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout. 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 And please continue. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Yes. Yay. Amen. Don't be timid. Don't be timid for what? What does the rest say after that? Tell my people of Israel of their sins. Tell people of their sins. Hmm. Hmm. What, was, what were they doing? They weren't telling these people of their sins. They were letting them participate in their church, right? They were listening to them. They were hanging out with them. They were not shouting like a trumpet their sin, right? Now, I'm not talking about getting your Bible out. Dude, you, bam, 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 bam. I'm not talking about hitting somebody over the head with their Bible. Say in love, 
Guys, man, it's what you're telling me is not in the Word of God. You need to go back and study. And that's it. We gotta shout it with the trumpet. Why is this? Why is America in the problems that it is? Because back in the 70s, the church started being quiet and letting the government run everything. Everything took place. So you have uh, Luke 9, 59 through 62. No, uh, Cindy. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom. Why, why, why are we reading this? Why, why are we reading this? Because these people weren't doing these things. They weren't doing these things. What they were is they were worried about the world. Okay, it says here, he says, first, he was saying, let me go bury my father. He's let the dead bury the dead. And then the next guy says, let me go say goodbye to my family. He said, man, come on. Don't put your hand on the pile and look behind you. Well, John disappeared. He's following Jesus. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Praise God. These people were worried about the world. They were worried about what their family and friends would think about them other than what Jesus thinks about them, Ooh. what God thinks about them. Wow. Where is it at? Where is it at? Who are we? Who are we? Wow. And we sing that first song. We add that first song, Thy Will. It was a request. Thy will be done. We say, oh, thy will be done. Thy will be done. As long as it agrees with my will. No. Come on. Does it say that anywhere in the Bible? No. That's what happened to Balaam, right? That's what happened to him. He wanted God's will. He's going to do what God's will, but let's, let's be sneaky about this. And he figured a way to get the money anyway. We have to be careful with what we follow, what we eat, what we participate in, who we have around us, the people that we have in our lives. Even if they are family, we have to be cautious. There's fam I'm telling you right now, I got blood relatives I have nothing to do with. I pray for them every single day. I pray for them. But I don't respond to them. I don't, it, it's always something that is secular. It's always, you need to do this. No, I need to read my Bible. You need to read this. This is a great book. No, I need to read my Bible. Everything that I need to know is in the Word of God. I don't need anything else. Because if, if I know if that person is sending me something, there's something in there that there's going to be a crack in my life. You follow me? Everybody understand that? Okay. Balaam here represents a corruptness in the church. A corruptness in the church. These are teachings from people that say they are believers that are speaking something to you that is not in the Word of God. These are deceptive teachings that they are using. That's what these Balaamites were doing. They. Why do people do these things? Why do people try to convince me that the Word of God, what they want me to know, what they want me to believe, that I can't find in the Word of God, why do they want to convince me of those things? Because they feel guilt about their own stuff. They want me to be in agreement with what they're doing, so their sin's okay. You don't need me for that. You need the Holy Spirit for that. You need to give it to Him. You need to give it to God. Right? Don't try to convince me. You talk to God because there's no change in God's mind, right? We know that right there. Don't try to come at me with your lifestyle and your worldly beliefs because if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you're wasting your breath. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to do this every single day. But you are wasting your breath unless you can come to me with scriptures that back up with what you're saying. If you can't do that, and I'm not talking about picking one scripture out here and saying this is what it's saying. Well, no, you read the before that and after that, and it's totally off base. I'm talking about the whole context of the Word of God. If you're going to come at me, I need to know where it is in the Word. Well, this is the way I feel. Feelings lie. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I have to keep my own feelings in check, right? I have to do that. Why? Because we want heavenly wisdom. 
It's so important that we spend time in our secret places. Everybody, if you don't know what a secret place is, get with me after church. I want to explain what a secret place is because I want to be very, very clear. A secret place is not going, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need that. No, God, tell me what I need to do. God, give me direction. And it lasts for as long as God has you there. You don't have an alarm on. You turn your phone off. You don't have the TV on. That's a secret place with him that you are going to him for wisdom. Because we see in James 3, James 3, verse 13, But you are wise and understand God's way. Prove it by living an honorable life. Mm. Wait a second. What? <laughs> if you are wise and understand God's way, prove it by living an honorable life. Mm. We're known by our fruit, right? Yes. If the fruit of the person that you're talking to is very obvious, it is rotten, stinking, nasty fruit that is that is growing from thistles and from uh, from the thorns. You know that it's not of God, okay? And here's the thing that we have to get past: success in a big bank account is not fruit. That's not fruit. A big pocketbook is not fruit, okay? It is not fruit. All right, God, I won't preach on that right now. Mm, come on now. So verse 13, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Verse 14, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. You know, when a, one, I'll, I'll talk to somebody and I'll ask them a question you know what, what the answer back to me that I have the most respect of? I don't know. Let's find out. Because if you talk to somebody and they know all the answers, usually means they know nothing. That's the truth. That's the truth. So we have to make sure that we have humility, right? Verse 15, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. You gotta believe the way I believe. You gotta do, you gotta, you gotta, you're believing falsely, you're doing this, you're, why are you screaming at me about the way I believe and if it's not in alignment for you, let's pray about it. I don't wanna pray, I want you to believe like me. That's a problem, right? If it comes with anger, comes with jealousy, comes with selfishness, such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic mm. for whatever wherever rather there is jealousy and selfish ambition there you will find disorder and evil of every kind their fruit they will be known by their fruit in verse 17 this is the kind of wisdom that we need verse 17 is the kind of wisdom that we need to find in our secret place that heavenly wisdom it all boils down to here but the wisdom from above is first of all pure praise god yes, it is also peace loving gentle at all times and willing to yield to others it is full of mercy and good deeds <clears throat> It shows no favoritism and is always sincere, always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Praise God. Praise God. That's the kind of wisdom that we need to find in our secret place, right? Yes. So where we go. And whatever we've followed that day, whatever we've taken into my flesh that day, I give to him. God, do I need to keep this? No. You need to throw that off. You need to cast that off. I need to cut off that pound of flesh, as the saying goes. Why? Because I don't need that. I need to give it to him. Why? Because he's a consuming fire. He will burn it. That slag, that fluff, that chaff, as the word of God says, will be burned away because he is a consuming God. I can't have it burned off if I don't spend time with him. If I'm not spending time with him, how am I going to change? Sunday morning, the hour and a half, two hours we're here, do not change us. You go to the doctor, right? 
I went to the doctor today. He gave me a new prescription. If you go home and you don't take that prescription, is there any change? If he tells you to change your diet, is there any change? If you don't get this test, you're going to die. If you don't go do it, is anything going to change? He gives us a divine prescription. Those are his commandments. That's what commandments, I have a new commandment. If you look at the Greek, it means a divine prescription. If we don't do those things, there's no change. We have to spend time with the Father to be changed. Amen. We all know birds of a feather flock together, right? We all know people, they get a new friend and all of a sudden they're totally different. Why is she dressing like that? Well, she's hanging out with her. <laughs> right? Why is she acting like that? Well, that's her boyfriend. Hmm. You know, we see that. We have to be cautious of those things because that's the stuff that we eat, who we're with, where we hang out. But he's so cute. I think it's a, I, th I think it's an answer to God's prayer. No, he beats you every night. He cheats on you every single time. How can that be an answer to God's prayer? That's not. And then we keep praying. God just make him call me back. Come on, am I am I being real or not? Come on, am I telling the truth or not? Don't we do that in all aspects of our life? And everybody's sitting here, well, I'm married. I don't have that problem. I'm talking about everything. Everything. Everything that we do. We've we got to pray about it first. We've got to put it before him. God, do I need to do this? Do I need to do this? This is so important that we do do that. Revelation 2.15. I'm sorry. Come on. Come on. 16. 15. Mm -hmm. 15. Come on. Verse 15. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. And the scripture that we, have, we just read before this is he says he hates their teaching. What is a Nicolaitan? We've covered this before, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. I want you to understand the Nicolaitans. They believe you could, again, they're very much like the Baalmites, that you could merge flesh and spirit and be okay. That you could sin all day long. You could do what you wanted into the flesh. Nicolaitans believe the flesh is dying. You can do whatever you want to with. Your spirit's saved. You don't have to worry. They don't have to repent anymore. They don't have to give it to God anymore. They can continue to do their lifestyle the way they want to do because they're saved. They're once saved, always saved kind of individuals. That's what the Nicolaitans were. Okay? Look it up. Research it. Understand. They wanted to make sure they knew that anything that they did in the flesh was okay because now I'm saved. I've got a covering. There is no such thing as a covering of grace. I've said this before. You need to understand it. It says there's a spirit of grace. Who's the spirit of grace? Capital S. There's your hint. Who's the spirit of grace? Holy, Holy spirit. spirit. The Holy Spirit. Grace. We've talked about this term before. There's two, there's two points to grace. One, in saving faith, it gets you saved. Number two, it strengthens you to walk holy. It strengthens you to walk righteous. It, strength, it strengthens you to put on the armor of God every single day. That's that ever, never ending, always flowing grace. It does not cover you. If I walk outside with an umbrella, I'm going to get wet, right? There's no such thing as covering of grace. What it is, is it empowers you to want to change and live righteously. If I sin, God convict me. If yes. this is not what I need to do, convict me. That's what grace truly does. That's what grace does. I want you to understand this. I need to make some things very crystal clear because I don't want any misunderstanding here at all. I asked this question. Everybody would agree with me. God loves you, right? Yes. yes. Jesus loves you, right? Yes. yes. The Holy Spirit loves you, right? Yes. Why does he have in the Bible over a hundred times the word repent? Over a hundred times from the beginning to the end, there's a hundred times, depending on which version you're reading. Okay? Why does he have that? Because he loves us. Yeah. Let me let you understand. Sin is a cancer. A literal and metaphorical cancer that will destroy our lives, right? Does God, who loves us so much, want us to live in sin? No. Does he want us to be open to the things that sin bring in our life? Well, it's just a little sin. There's no such thing. 
There are people in hell today for little sins and big sins alike. A sin is a sin is a sin. There's only one sin, as the Bible says, that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that's unforgivable. But every other sin, no matter how small, oh, it's just a little white lie. It's a lie. It's just a little murder. Well, that's not how, how can that? No, it's the same thing, guys. We have to give it to him. That's why he says repent. And we see that in this next ch in this next verse, but we're going to finish this first. We are not called to be sinners. We're not called to be sinners. I mean, I know people that are Christians that go, I'm just a sinner. I just did it because I'm a sinner. That's like saying I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm speaking curses over my life. Come on. When I say those things, I am cursing. Not that the witch doesn't need to get her little cauldron and start blowing up some kind of spell over me. I've done it to myself. Yes. I've spoken these things over myself. Yes. Life and death comes from what? The tongue. The tongue. The tongue. Come on. I've cursed myself with these things. When I say that I am a sinner, I want you to understand, as long as we are in the flesh, we're going to sin. Okay, As long as we have the flesh, praise God, the flesh is not permanent. Praise, praise God, we will be given a new body according to the, the Bible, right? Because right now, in this flesh, I can walk down the street. My mind goes over here. I'm like, how did that even happen? <laughs> yeah. Right? God, forgive me for that. I confess it right now. I repent it in Jesus' name. I start praying in my prayer language. I start talking to him. I start praying to him. Because when I'm in my prayer language and I'm talking to him, my mind doesn't drift over here, right? Mm -hmm. It's when I'm not doing those things that my mind drifts over here, right? right? So I'm in my flesh. What do I do? I command my flesh to obey by doing that. We want to make sure that that, can't, that sin, that little bitty tiny sin right there, doesn't grow. We talked about the tiger, the woman that had the tiger before. She had that baby tiger, and she, oh, she loved it. She fed it. She slept with it. It got bigger, and it ate her in her own home. True story. Why? Because when it was little, it wasn't a big deal. When that sin grew, it devoured her. You follow? Mm -hmm. Because sin will destroy you. Sin from the very beginning, even though it's small, is has the potential to destroy our lives. That's why we need to claim over ourselves, I'm holy, I'm righteous, I'm set apart, I'm a child of God, he loves me. I don't need to do those things. I don't want to do those things. That's not who I'm there. I don't care if my best friend says, let's go out and have fun. I'm not going to do that because one day I'm going to stand in front of him, in front of the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, and I got my friend's not going to be there with me. Come on. My wife is not going to be there with me. Well, she was because she'd say a lot of great things, but she's not going to be, right? Mm -hmm. She's not going to be there. We're there. My brothers, my sisters, my mom, my dad, they're not going to be sitting there next to me. It is. It says, work out your own salvation. I got work to do. I need to make sure if anybody comes in that's a, a Balaamite or a Nicolaitan that I say, nope, don't want to hear it. Don't want to participate. Don't want to do it. Because mm. we're not called sinners. In a sinful lifestyle... Or by walking in it, as it says in Romans 12. I'm going to read this from the message as well. This is pretty powerful. It'll be different than you've ever read it before. I, I like the message Bible because it kind of breaks it down into very simple. Even a kindergartner can understand the message translation. So here's what I want you to do. That's why all of this, what we're talking about, is so important. Here is what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, even my sleeping, yes, even your sleeping, eating, even the things I eat, yes, even the things you eat, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Mm. Everybody get that? Yes. No matter what you do, no matter how big, no matter how small, we have to do it for him. We have to put it before him as our offering. God, this is what I did for you today. Or I was too busy, God, I did this for myself today. That's what this scripture is saying. I need to do all things for him and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Mm. 
Amen. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture, to society, to your friends, to your relatives, to your workmates, to your co-workers, all of these things. Don't become so adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants for you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, the culture around us, mm, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Amen. The culture around us wants us to be down where it's at, right? You ever got ahead of your friends? Okay, you got to the point where you've got an advancement at work or something is blessings have come in your life and all of a sudden they don't want to be your friends anymore, right? Because you're over here, up here, and they're like, well, we want you down where we're at. You know, you everybody understand what I'm talking about? Okay. You, you know your true friends instantaneously when yep. you get ahead in life and they don't want that for That's you. Right. You know instantly where they stood. The culture around us wants to drag us down to its level of maturity. The next scripture, Revelation 12, 2, rather 16. Revelation 2, 16. Yeah. Repent. Here, there's that word. And here it is in Revelation, right? Is he talking to sinners or is he talking to the pagans or is he talking to Christians? Who's he talking to here? Everybody can answer. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the church, right? He's telling them to repent. Here it is at the end of the book. He's saying, repent. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't need to repent. <laughs> repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Wow. Why does he ask us so often? We just covered that. He doesn't want sin to affect us. He wants us... If, if every sin was taken care of on the cross, right? Every sin was taken care of, the finished work of the cross, the blood that he left there, everything was left on the cross, right? Am I correct or am yes, I correct? Yes, right? Yes. Okay, all of this happened, right? He wants to make sure we leave it up there. Yes. If I go up to the cross and I go, I'm going to use this today, what does repentance do? It puts it right back up there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that way. We have to understand what repent even means. Repent means to have an abhorrence. This is be horrified of the sins that you had in your life yes. before you became saved. Right, right. Be horrified by the, what you did before. I will never go back there again. And what we just talked about earlier in Isaiah 58 and then in Luke, I want to read also in 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, we'll turn to it real quick, real quick. 2 Corinthians 12, 21. Wow. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 21. This is right after Paul talked about the thorn in his flesh. 21. This is why it's so important that when we have Balaamites and when we have uh, Nicolaitans in us, around us, when we have people preaching falsely, when we have these things going on around us, why it's important for us to stand up. Because he says, I'm actually afraid that on my next visit, my God will humble me in front of you as I shed tears over those who keep sinning without repenting of their impurity, sexual immorality, and perversions. That covers every possible sin, right? Yes. I'm afraid when I come back, I'm going to be heartbroken to see that the people in the church are not repenting. That's what it says. Wow. He's going to be heartbroken. He's going to be shedding tears over those who keep on sinning without any repenting. That's in the Word of God. So you can't tell me anything other than what's in the Word of God. You cannot stand on I stand on this. This is the solid foundation, right? This right here is the rock yes. that I put my entire being on. Yes. 
you haven't figured it out by now, you have to understand God does all these things because he loves you. Yes. He loves you. Don't misinterpret any of this. Well, he's just saying, man, he wants me to do too much. No, he's saying, if you do this, I love you so much. Yes. It's not going to affect you. It's not going to come into your life. You're not going to have to deal with things that happen. Because what happened when, when Balaam did that and the Moabite women came in? That's when Baal got ushered into the nation of Israel. And we know years later, they were still dealing with Baal. Years later, when Elijah, okay, Elijah came and he built the altar and he told the guys that were priests for Baal, and these were Jewish priests for Baal, when he said, build your altar, and they prayed over their altar all day long. And Elijah even said this. This is in the word of God. This is why I know God has a sense of humor. He says, your God must be out using the restroom. He literally says this, right? And then what does he do? He calls out to God and God comes down in the altar that is covered with water. He dug a ditch around that altar, filled it up with water. It all disintegrated with the consuming fire of God and they killed all of the Baal priests, right? So here we see that just that little bitty crack of the Baalamites, that little bitty crack of Balaam, for years later, Israel had to deal with it. That's God loves you so much. He doesn't want you to have to deal with these things. Why does he have commandments? Why does he have the law? Why are these things in place? Because he loves you. He doesn't want you to do these things. You know, you see your kid and they're reaching over. They're going to put their finger in the light socket. What do you do? You stop them, right? Because you love them. You don't say, they'll figure it out. Right? You're a bad parent, man. They're gonna call the CPS on you. Somebody sees that and like, I need to take that kid, that kid away from that dude, right? But God will tell you, don't stick your finger in that socket, Ben. You're spending time with me. You don't need to do that. Just this once. No. Okay, God. That seemed like an opportunity. That seemed like something that would have been good. But you're telling me, no, I don't want to do those things because he loves me. He doesn't want me to go in that direction. We do not want the world around us, this progressive Christian philosophy that's going on out there. That, the, the, uh, the grace doctrine, the hyper grace doctrine, the, uh, the uh, what are those guys that are preaching about the... Uh, if you get saved, you become rich. What's it called? Prosperity. Prosperity. There, I don't know. <laughs> Prosperity doctrine that's being taught today. Those are not in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Those are not. That social justice doctrine is being preached these days. No. Where is that in the Word of God? Mm. We need to go back to the blocking and tackling, the basics. Where does that happen? Come on. Rachia. Rachia. Well, I don't know what to say. Spend some time in the Word. Amen. The Holy Spirit will come in. The things that I read all the time, I'll be reading things. I don't think I forgot them. The Holy Spirit brings them up to the front, and boom, there it is for me. Yes. I, I, I might spend an hour studying that thing, and then six months later, the reason I studied it six months ago was I need it right now. But i got to spend time in the Word. got to spend time in the Word, because the world will tell me, grow up the world is changing the world will tell me it's a new world out there you need to come along with us you need to change your understanding of the word of god because this is the way it is now no it's not the way it is now it's the same in the beginning it's the same today and it's the same in the end it's the same all times <coughs> last verse last verse revelation 2 verse 17 This is very interesting. Why he's talking about manna from heaven and the white stone. I'm going to explain what those things mean. But the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully. What heart are we talking about? Our spirit heart, right? Yes. We open our spirit ears. 
our spirit eyes to the word of God, to his knowledge, to his wisdom, as what we read just a moment ago in James. We have to be open to that. Let him listen carefully to what the spirit is presently saying to all the churches, mm. all the churches, even unto today, to everyone who is victorious, everyone that stands up, everyone that goes in his perfect will, everyone that does not falter, does not let false teaching into his body, everyone that is victorious, I will let him feast mm. on the hidden manna and give him a shining white stone and written upon the white stone is inscribed his new name, known only to the one who receives it. We have to understand why he's talking about manna. We know with a lot of these Christians were Jews at one time, and they had a belief that when the Messiah showed up, God would again send manna from heaven to feed them. Okay? So the manna that we want, the fago, the fago of the manna we want is the word of God, right? That's what we want to consume because he is a consuming fire. We want it to consume us. Those are the things that we need to eat. The white stone, as I researched, this was very interesting. At that particular time, if you were a criminal and you went before a judge, if he handed you a white stone, you were innocent. If he handed you a black stone, you were guilty. What did Jesus say? I will give you a white stone, but I'm guilty, Jesus. I don't care. I pay the price on the cross, man. Mm -hmm. You are victorious. You followed my will. You did what you wanted, what I wanted you to do. You stayed away. You repented from sin. You flee from those things. Here's your white stone, and here's your new name that you can read. Also, we know that at that particular time, we all we all know what ticket stubs are, right? We get a ticket stub, we go to an event. At that time, a ticket stub was a white stone. It gave you admittance into wow. the event. That white stone, what event do we want to go to? Heaven. Heaven. Yes. Right? Heaven. He's given us a white stone. When Amen. we go victoriously, here's your white stone. Come in. Spend time with the Father. I'm, I, the first thing I'm going to do is go sit in his lap. <laughs> I'm going to sit in. I want to hug from him. Yes. I want to hug. I want to thank you for loving me so much. Yes. Telling me what your word says. Yes. Imparting your wisdom into me. Yes. Teaching me. Loving me. Every single day teaching me something new. Yes, God. Thank you for that. Thank you. Jesus. Thank you. I'm going to get to spend all eternity with you now. All mm. eternity with you now. Mm. Do you have anything that you want to add? He will feed us. And he will, by the price paid on the cross, show us mercy. will show us a guiltless verdict. No matter what we've done in our lives, we've given it to him. We repent of those things, put it back on the cross. When we do those things in Jesus Christ as our Savior, he will give us the grace that we need to do to have strength to walk victoriously against the things of this world Amen. and his loving he lovingly rewards us at all times what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what we should flee from as long as we have him as our lord as well if you would please bow your heads and close your eyes Bluetooth connected. Yes, in Jesus' name. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you continue to do in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you give us a roadmap. And our roadmap, your roadmap is always straight, Father God. You make the crooked path straight. You give us the things that we need to stay away from, the things that we need to flee from. Father God, and when we heed your voice, you lead us victoriously every single time. So, Father God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for teaching us how to live an uncompromising life. Father God, in you, Jesus, you inside of us as a light unto the world. Thank you for that. Continue to bow your heads and close your eyes. Now is the time. Now is the time. If you know in your spirit right now that you are not where you need to be with him in a 
committed love relationship with him. First opportunity is if you've never given your life to Christ, ever given your life to Christ. And the key to this, a lot of people, I don't know. If you don't know, then you've never given your life to him. So if now is the opportunity, now is the time. If you've never given your life to Christ here or online, I want you to raise your hand right now and give your life to Christ. He's calling you, calling you to be his child. Yes, in Jesus' name. Second opportunity for the prodigal children out there. You lived in his house. You lived in his shadow. You lived in the, in the shadow of El Shaddai. And you've left it. You've gone and done your things. Like we see Demas. Demas in the word of God. Part of Paul's ministry. And he loved the world and went back to it. And you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you're ready to come back to him now. Now is the time to come back to him. If that is you. If you're that prodigal child and you're ready to come home. Raise your hand. It's between you and God. Raise your hand in Jesus name. Yes Father God. In Jesus' name. If everyone would please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you. For sending your son. For sending your son. Your one begotten son. Your one begotten son. To the cross. To the cross. To die for my sins. To die for my sins. To pay the price. To pay the price. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. For paying the ultimate sacrifice. For paying the ultimate sacrifice. On the cross. On the cross. Delivering me from my sins. Delivering me from my sins. Thank you. Thank you. You are my Savior. You are my Savior. And you are my Lord. And you are my Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guys online, we appreciate you joining us. We thank you so much. Um, if you did accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today, please get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. Guys, if you're close by, Close by here in the area, we invite you to come join us. We would love to have you. Guys, we're not a handshaking church. We're a hugging church. So come on. We're going to love you just like Jesus loves us. So we encourage you to come, come and visit. Guys, if you're too far and you're looking for a church, get in touch with us. We will help you find a Bible-based, gospel-filled church yes. that is operating in the truth of the word today. Praise God. And if you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, and 1.5 billion people in this world today do not have a Bible, please get in touch with us. We will get a Bible in your hands. Guys, we love you, and we'll see you soon. Yes. 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 yes.